1978, a Nobel Prize was shared by scientists Werner Arbor, Daniel Nathans, and Hamilton Smith for the discovery of restriction enzymes, a very important tool in the toolkit of the modern molecular biologist. Interestingly, restriction enzymes were discovered by scientists who were working with a virus called a bacteriophage. This is an electron micrograph of a bacteriophage called the T4 phage. Phage viruses all have similar structures, generally with a head, a tail, and tail fibers made of protein. And inside the head is where you'll find genetic information. Viruses are floating particles of DNA or RNA that are constantly in search of a host. For T4 phage, the host is E. coli bacteria. In fact, all bacteriophage only infect bacteria cells. But when they infect a cell, what happens inside the cell is very similar to what happens when animal cells and plant cells are infected by their viruses. The process of infection is called the lytic cycle. Let's see how it works. First, the bacteriophage virus adsorbs to the outside surface of the bacterial cell host, and then it has to inject its genetic information into the host cell. Now that genetic information contains genes that are recipes to make all the proteins that that virus is composed of. So once it's inside the host cell, ribosomes are going to use the transcribed DNA or messenger RNA to make viral proteins. Cellular proteins will also replicate the virus's genetic information. Once all the bits and pieces of these viruses are produced, they're also assembled inside the host cell, and this process continues until the cell explodes. We call this cell lysis, and the cell is now dead. When animal viruses and plant viruses infect cells, this is often the end result. Phage reproduce inside their host bacteria cells exponentially. Once a single cell is infected in a group of cells, it will very quickly spread new viruses along to surrounding cells and whole colonies can be wiped out in a very short amount of time. In the 1960s and 70s, Scientists observed the lytic cycle in their laboratories, and once in a while, there were surprise results. One of these surprise results led to this very important discovery of restriction enzymes. The surprise was this. Sometimes the bacteriophage would adsorb to the outside of the bacterial cell and inject its genetic information, but instead of viral replication happening inside the cell, the cells survived. There was no making of viral proteins or copying of viral DNA. Instead, the viral DNA was digested or cut into smaller pieces. Some of the bacteria cells contained enzymes that were able to bind to the viral DNA and break it into smaller pieces. These enzymes were called restriction enzymes because they restricted the virus from reproducing. Today, these enzymes can be removed from bacteria, and in a tube, they can be used to cut any DNA that we need. This is very useful in the field of genetic engineering, but there are some rules. Here are the names of a couple enzymes, restriction enzymes. One is ECOR1 and HINDI3. Beside the name of each enzyme is what we call a recognition sequence. ECOR1 will only cut a strand of DNA if it finds this six letter sequence, and that's where it will cut. HINDI3 will only cut if it reads this six letter sequence, A-A-G-C-T-T. So these enzymes are somewhat selective. In fact, not somewhat, extremely selective for the most part about where they will cut a DNA sequence. There are hundreds of restriction enzymes that scientists can choose from these days, They've all got these kind of funky names. ECOR1, for example, has this name because of where it's originally from, this strain of E. coli, E. coli strain RY13. 
And this one at the end means it was the first from this particular strain of bacteria. HIND3 is normally found in H. influenzae RD. That's the HIND part. And it's the third from this particular type of bacterial strain. So let's see how this can be used in the field of genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is moving genes, moving DNA between different living things or modifying the genetic makeup of a living thing. So first, let's see how these enzymes cut. Imagine this is a double-stranded piece of DNA in a tube and I've added to it ECOR1. It will only cut at the sequence GAATTC. Do you see that sequence? I think I see it. Let's add the enzyme and see what happens. Well, it existed twice in this particular sequence of DNA. So at GAATTC, ECOR1 made a cut. Please note the cut is between the first two letters of this particular DNA sequence, between the G and the A. Same thing here at the second site between the G and the A. But don't forget, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. Across from every G, there's a C. Across from every T, there's an A. The opposite strand, or reverse strand, also has that same recognition sequence. It's just backwards. But the enzyme only cuts between the G and the A of the reverse sequence. Same thing over here. When we separate out the fragments, we now have three pieces of DNA where we started with one. And the pieces or fragments that are left over have these interesting single-stranded overhanging edges that we call sticky ends, A-A-T-T-A-A-T-T. -T -T. They're complementary to one another, which means the bases match up. And that's useful in genetic engineering because sometimes we want to remove a piece of DNA and sometimes we want to rejoin pieces of DNA. So if DNA fragments have matching sticky ends because they were cut by the same enzyme, they can be ligated or glued together. So let's look at a practical example. We often use a gene at the DNA Learning Center for a protein called GFP, or green fluorescent protein. In molecular biology, that jellyfish gene is often inserted into the cells of other living things, and it's used as a genetic tag or a marker. Well, let's imagine what we want to do is transfer the gene from the jellyfish to another living thing. The first step is isolating the gene or the sequence of DNA that codes for this protein of interest. So here's my gene. What I need to do is cut the DNA before and after my gene of interest. So I need to find an enzyme that has a recognition sequence in an area where it can cut, but not interfere with my gene. Let's imagine that ECOR1 is that enzyme. It found its restriction site and it made two cuts. We've got a cut here with sticky ends and a cut here with sticky ends. Now imagine I'd like to insert this jellyfish gene into the genome of a mouse. Well, what do I need to do to the mouse's DNA first? I need to make an opening. And I have to use the same enzyme in the mouse's DNA as I did in the jellyfish's DNA. So we have matching sticky ends. So let's imagine there's a restriction site that doesn't interfere with any other genes in the mouse's genome. And once I've made an opening, I can ligate or glue the jellyfish gene into the mouse's DNA. The sticky ends are complementary. Everything's matching up. I add a little bit of ligase or glue and boom, I've inserted the gene into the mouse's DNA. This is an oversimplification of the process, but hopefully you can now see how restriction enzymes are indeed a very useful tool for molecular biologists. Who would have thought that scientists studying phage, tiny little viruses that infect bacteria cell, would discover something so powerful.